Inequality is now at the forefront of the global development agenda. For example, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, as well as its predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals, are frameworks aimed at addressing global inequality. They are also frameworks that suggest inequality is best addressed through development. How and why did inequality, and by extension, development become a global issue? And what has made addressing inequality so urgent for ensuring more sustainable development? Let's explore this by starting with a provocation, followed by three critical observations on the history of development and inequality. The provocation. Think about this. What if development causes inequality? In his seminal text, Stone Age Economics, political anthropologist Marshall Salins made this observation. One third to one half of humanity are set to go hungry every night. This is the era of hunger unprecedented. Now in the era of greatest technical power, starvation is an institution. This paradox is my whole point. This quote challenges us to rethink many assumptions people hold about development and underdevelopment. The paradox identified by Salins captures development as a contradictory process. What Salins' example alerts us to is this. The ostensibly developed world has historically created a system in which hunger and malnutrition are integral to the lived experiences of significant numbers of people. The paradox lies in the contrast he draws with societies we often refer to as traditional. Although often beset by inequality, stemming from familial hierarchies too, on the whole, livelihoods were organized both sustainably and so that few, if any, would have to go hungry. Conventionally, in development thinking, we associate the notion of backwardness with frugal lives and progress with the promises of modernization and modernization theory. Our notions of sustainability and sustainable development are also aligned with such sentiments. Salins challenges us to think of sustainable development differently. With this in mind, we can now turn to three related critical observations about the history of development and inequality. One, the history of inequality must really be understood in relation to the history of development. Two, Inequality is not external to development processes, but has been a constitutive aspect of them. And three, development through modernization is contested, also because it may not actually be sustainable. In order to deepen these critical observations, let's briefly examine a key turning point in the history of modern development. In his book, The Great Transformation, Karl Polanyi demonstrates the human and ecological costs associated with the institution of the market as the ordering principle of social and political life. Polanyi traces this to the enclosures which intensified in the late 17th century and culminated in the abolition of the controversial poor laws. With this shift, Polanyi argues that the core organizing principles of capitalist development were established. Land, labor, and money were to become the cornerstones of modern development. However, Polanyi makes a critical observation. He astutely notes that land, labor, and money are not real commodities, but they were nevertheless established and treated as if they were. This entails tensions, and as a result, Polanyi argues this modern project will never be realizable comprehensively. Therefore, for Polanyi, social and political relations will always be premised on a double movement. This means that as some social forces push to deepen capitalist social relations, there will always be pushbacks from society to ameliorate the destructive effects this generates, hence the double movement. It is important to be clear, Polanyi was not against markets per se. He recognizes that historically there have been many societies with markets. However, the idea of market society is, according to him, new and unprecedented in the history of development globally. As development often aims to further entrench market society, it also drives the double movement. 
Polanyi's critical insights have been gaining prominence since the 1980s, especially since the rise of social movements against neoliberal development. But Polanyi's notion of a double movement was somewhat constricted by his focus on struggles against economic inequality in the UK and the West more generally. His analysis did not concentrate on inequalities of race or gender, for example. Importantly, especially for a global context, nor did his account of domination and dispossession account for colonialism and its legacies. There have hence been sympathetic correctives to Polanyi's omissions. For instance, Professor Philip McMichael in Development and Social Change shows how colonialism unravels a development puzzle. Our framing of states as discrete units that can be compared in terms of their stages of development does not account for colonial relations and their legacies. McMichael and other critics working from similar premises show that the development of the West depended crucially, if not exclusively, on the exploitation of colonized territories and the peoples living there. In a related argument, O'Brien and Williams in Global Political Economy demonstrate the importance of what is referred to as the triangular trade. This entailed trade in enslaved persons, which contributed to the industrial development in the UK and Europe more generally. The double movement, hence, must go deeper than Polanyi's heuristic to reveal the multiple relations of inequality that have accompanied the history of development. This also means that we need to acknowledge and understand the role of resistance in development. Practices of resistance have been directed against relations of domination, such as enslavement, dispossession through the enclosures, colonialism and its racialized methods of rule, as well as to challenge gender and class relations. The issues we have raised here have long been recognized. In the 21st century, the multiple practices of resistance to domination in development have been referred to by Professor Phil McMichael as one big counter-movement against the market calculus. Among such counter-movements is, for instance, La Vie Campesina, the food sovereignty movement, which is a global movement for sustainable development, but not in the sense envisaged by the SDGs. La Vie Campesina privileges equitable social relations and ecological sustainability in their approach to food production. More recently, struggles especially by indigenous peoples, for example in Bolivia and Ecuador, to formally recognize the rights of Mother Nature have come to prominence. These can be seen as important initiatives that aim to restore the rights of nature as part of struggles over the environment and development. They add an entire new quality to thinking about sustainability and development. Can these attempts to decommodify land and labor undermine the national development paradigm as conventionally understood? Why should this matter? Is the history of inequality taken into account in dominant perspectives on development? The answer is yes and no. The implications of subscribing to either are significant. Dominant accounts of development clearly document inequality. They describe inequalities. For example, we can get a sense of the extent and breakdown through some of the goals and targets of the SDGs. However, for the most part, these inequalities are not explained as part of the history of development. Rather, they are configured as the unrealized potential of development. This is because development as conventionally understood is premised on modernization theory. Modernization theory assumes discrete units, states, developing by climbing a metaphorical ladder, unconnected among one another in space and time. From this perspective, inequality is a necessary step on the rungs of the ladder of development, rather than an effect of politically sanctioned, unequal social relations. When we think about development achievements, many of us will fall back on familiar categories such as gross domestic product, GDP, which measure the wealth of a nation. However, GDP does not tell us anything about how wealth has been realized or distributed. From a critical perspective like the one we have just gone through, inequality is constituted by relations of development. It is not an originating or natural condition. 
a critical perspective foregrounds analytically substantive relations over formal categories too often associated with measuring development, such as national development. Let us return to Salin's provocation in the context of Polanyi's insights of the history of development through inequality. There has been consistent resistance to development, be this through labour movements, women's movements or anti-colonial struggles. While we have seen that Polanyi's insights are significant for understanding struggles over development, we also saw that he does not incorporate colonialism or questions of race or gender into his analysis. Therefore, while Sauerland's provocation is compelling and Polanyi's insights pertinent, we need to work towards a more comprehensive understanding of our globally shared history of development through inequalities. If we want to get an appreciation of what actors like the 180 million plus organized under the umbrella of La Via Campesina are telling us about development, we will have to combine the insights of both and work towards adding our and their own. Equally, to better appreciate indigenous struggles over the rights of nature, we will need to deepen our understanding of colonialism and appreciate that sustainable development is contested in theory and practice. We have merely touched upon some very important issues. Yet, I hope this has inspired you to commit to learning more about the history of development and inequality.